Good evening, everyone. Thankful for you tuning in and being a part of our daily devotional series uh, as we've been uh, pursuing some different ideas and different things as we've been going along now for uh, roughly about six weeks. And thankful for each and every one of you that have been tuning in and being a part of this and sharing this and, and offering up opportunities to others uh, to view these and to study along with us. We're certainly grateful for that and, uh, and look forward to to continuing these even after uh, we are able once again to meet and be together. With that being said, as we begin, just a, a quick word. Um, I did want to pass along to you uh, this note from the elders. Many of you have already seen this. If you visited our website, uh, it was even shared on our Facebook page, uh, as well as a call went out uh, and a text went out as well and an email. So we just want to make sure we get this word uh, to everyone, but the elders wanted our church family to know that we will be assembling together for worship Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in the parking lot of the church building. We are going to attempt to live stream the worship on Facebook. Uh, Sunday morning Bible class will be online only. Uh, we're asking everyone except our elderly and handicapped to park in the school parking lot across the street from the church building and to please bring chairs for your family. If you feel the need to wear gloves or a mask, please feel free to do so. And if possible, please practice social distancing. We are trying to adhere to the guidelines communicated to us by our government officials. More importantly, it is our desire for our church family to assemble together as the Lord's church and worship to God. Please come early, be in place so we can begin at 10 a.m. The church building and the annex will be open for use as needed. Sunday night and Wednesday night services will continue to be online only. We love you. We look forward to seeing all of you on Sunday morning. Again, that's a message from the elders of the congregation. So we're certainly uh, rejoicing at the fact that we do get to return at least uh, in some small way back to a, a normal worship service. And we all look forward to that on Sunday morning. As we begin our study tonight, we continually are trying to challenge our third through sixth graders to, to list three things that they know about particular Bible stories or characters. And tonight's no different. Uh, ask them to give you three pieces of information about Joshua. And uh, his story is a fascinating one. It's an incredible one. And just see what it is that they might know or remember uh, about the story of Joshua. As we move forward in our study, we change, kind of change gears a little bit when it came time Tuesday for our daily devotional. We moved away from proving or trying to prove or trying to discuss the existence of God to discussing uh, the, the Bible itself, the Word of God. And we talked a little bit about inspiration Tuesday just by way of review. This was the definition that we were using from Gawson. Inspiration is that inexplicable power which the Divine Spirit put forth of old on the authors of the Holy Scripture in order uh, for their guidance, even in the employment of the words they used, and to preserve them alike from all error from all omission. And we said that basically if you break that down, that definition, if you break that down, and we see it in three different passages, those three we looked at during our time together. Tuesday night, 2 Timothy 3, uh, verse 16, a, a very familiar passage to you that all Scripture is God-breathed. Uh, in Job 32, it's the same sort of similar idea that God was driving that, was the driving force behind the things that were written. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, again, the same sentiment. But we said if you broke that definition down, what you come out with is the idea of inspiration is unexplained power of the Holy Spirit exerted on the writers in order to guide and preserve from error and omission. So we said inspiration, uh, as you can see, it's, it is, it's vital to proving or discussing even the idea of the Bible being the very words of God uh, you must accept the idea of divine inspiration. Along with that discussion, you have this other word that we're going to talk a little bit more about today, and that is the idea of revelation. And no, we're not talking about the book of Revelation. I know that many people would say, oh, we're going to have a study on Revelation. Uh, not today. And we don't, I don't know that we've got enough time in these daily devotionals even to get into that study. But at some point, it's, it's certainly worth the study. But we're talking about the literal definition of the word revelation as it pertains to Scripture. So there's two important elements. It's very important for you to understand both of these parts when it comes to discussing 
the Bible as the Word of God. Number one, Revelation, which is the message itself. It is the embodiment of divine truth. It is the, the physical message of divine truth. And then inspiration, it goes hand in hand with it. Inspiration is the manner. It is the expression of divine truth. So it's very important as we kind of move into this discussion about the Bible being the Word of God, that we understand these two elements uh, at a deeper level than just, uh, I guess we would say, sort of skin deep. I know that many of us could define, at least in some way, shape, or form, these two words uh, in a generic way, but it is important that you and I be able to define them in a scriptural way, uh, in a way that pertains to the discussion we are having so, because of that, we want to spend the remainder of our time today on this slide here concerning what Revelation is not. Revelation is not inspiration. Revelation precedes inspiration. Where Revelation discloses inspiration guides, inspiration extends to Revelation and known facts. The uninspired receive Revelation. The Bible contains uh, revelatory facts. Uh, bottom line, when you start talking about revelation and the idea uh, of it, you get into this discussion of what the, what types of revelation there are. Now, there, there's the idea of a general or a natural revelation. You see that in Psalm 19 and verse 1. This is a passage we've referred to a few times already uh, in our discussion about God. In Psalm 19 and verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. Uh, that is speaking to the idea of natural revelation. That is, every morning that you wake up and you look outside, you see the sunshine, you see the clouds, you see the stars, you see whatever you see uh, in each morning and each evening, that is a form of revelation. It's a general form uh, that you can uh, notice and take part in pretty much every day. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, the exact same sentiment being delivered this time by Paul. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Again, it's the exact same idea that there is a generic or general revelation taking place even in nature. A couple of others in Acts, Acts chapter 14, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 17 specifically, the Bible says here, yet he did not leave himself without witness. This is Paul speaking about God. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Again, this is the same idea being spoken of here, that there is a general revelation taking place. And then one other, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 27, you'll recognize that this passage is when Paul is speaking on the Areopagus in Athens, and he is speaking to people who view themselves as intellectually superior. And yet Paul notices this, this thing that they've built to an unknown God. And he goes on to be able to preach a really powerful sermon to them. But in that sermon contained in there, verse 27, Paul says that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. Uh, and the idea being there that, that, that revelation is taking place all around you. It is general, it is uh, natural, and, and it takes place all around us. Secondarily, there is a, a special type of revelation, or what we would call sort of supernatural revelation. This is communication of truths not known through nature, intuition, logic, etc. And you can't know them without divine aid. Uh, it appears in various forms throughout Scripture, dreams, visions, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ himself. Um, but you have a couple of, of things that I do want to point out to you first and foremost. Go to Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16 specifically, you, you get really word for word Jesus saying this. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, this is verse 13, Matthew chapter 16. Who do people say the Son of Man is? He asked his disciples. They said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now listen to this. Listen to Jesus' answer to Simon's statement. Jesus answered him, verse 17, 
Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So in that case, you find Jesus openly stating this was not a natural or general revelation that took place uh, in that moment when, when Peter makes that statement. He, Jesus is acknowledging that this was a special or supernatural revelation that has taken place that that Peter has been able to experience things that are not natural, things that are not general. Uh, not everyone can do the things that Jesus was doing or teaching. And so Jesus says, because of that, it has caused you to come to this, this um, realization that I am exactly who I said I am. I am the Son of God. And because of that, Jesus gives credit to God and says this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but instead it was revealed to you by my Father who is in heaven. Obviously, there are other points of reference, especially if you go back into the Old Testament. If you remember, we studied the story of Daniel uh, not too long ago in these daily devotionals. You think about the times where God allowed Daniel to not only realize the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, but to interpret it and to give that interpretation. You go all the way back and you think about Joseph and you think about the dreams that Joseph had and those dreams coming true and how God put those dreams right there in front of Joseph, and then those things came, that's revelation. Those things were revealed to him as a, at an early age that were going to happen at a, at a later time. You think about all the prophets, you think about all the things that were said and done. We spoke at length concerning the idea of the Babylonian captivity and how Jeremiah spoke to the idea that it was going to be 70 years they were going to stay there before God delivered them out of there. So many other examples that we could choose to, uh, to mention here, but the idea, the point to be made simply is this, that there are times that Revelation was done through a supernatural uh, aspect, through a supernatural avenue. Uh, it's interesting that there are those out there today who claim that they are still having some type of supernatural appearance when that's not the case. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a passage you've probably heard before and, and certainly has been read at times, uh, and I don't have a problem with this, but it, it, this is not, it's really out of context to read this uh, as though it's being written between a, a human husband and a human wife. That's not really what this is intended for. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, is written concerning uh, what Paul's writing about there. He's writing about the church, and he talks about the church caring for one another and the church presenting itself in an appropriate way and what he says there, verse 8, does not need to be overlooked. He says, love never ends as for prophecies. They will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. We know in part and we prophesy in part. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. There's a reason why uh, we in the church do not um, proclaim that we're getting some sort of supernatural Revelation. The revelation we speak about is strictly from the Word of God. It's from the study of the Word of God. It's uh, if if you want to use the idea of revelation in in the sense that what we're talking about here, you would have to say it was general or natural revelation. It's things that we see. It's things that we experience that reveal to us God's presence. But we do not claim any form of supernatural revelation. There's two important facts that you need to know as we close this particular study together. I don't want you to think that there is no revelation whatsoever. Revelation is definitely possible, number one. Number two, revelation is absolutely necessary. It is absolutely necessary for revelation to take place in your life personally. It's important for you to study the Word of God, to have the things of the Word of God be revealed to you in your study in your participation in the studies that we have as a church family, as a congregation. It's important that that takes place. It's important that that's uh, something that you place a high level of importance on. So Revelation, uh, sort of in closing, I guess we would say Revelation is not inspiration, but Revelation is still incredibly important to your growth as a Christian, to my growth as a Christian. And I want to focus in the last moment here on that last thing that you see on the slide there, the Bible contains revelatory facts. It is important you spend time in the Word so that you can better understand what God is revealing to you. We are thankful for each and every one of you. We can't wait uh, for Sunday morning for our time to worship together. 
and I hope that you all have a wonderful evening.